Hello gentlemen, this is C.S. McTell. Today I would like to explore the topic of gender and crime by focusing specifically on why there are more males in jails than females. I decided to explore this topic because I came across an article in The Guardian, and the article was titled, Are Men Natural Born Criminals? The Prison Numbers Don't Lie. The author of the article, a Jessica Abraham, stated, Our jails are overflowing with men. While women account for less than 5% of the prison population, there are 84,731 people in prison in Britain, and according to the latest figures, 80,915 of them are men. Less than 5% of this country's prison population is female, and that trend is similar elsewhere in the Western world. In France, it's about 3%, in Germany, just under 6%. The global median is about 4.3%, according to the figures from the International Center for Prison Studies. And she then went on to say that you can find all sorts of trends by analyzing the demographics of the prison population that might tell us something about the groups most likely to offend, at least at a level warranting, incarceration. But perhaps the most striking and persistent is that serious crime is still overwhelmingly committed by men. Unfortunately, Jessica misses the real issue by a very, very long mile. So, Jessica attempts to pin the blame for this gender difference in incarceration rates on male biology. In one paragraph, she stated that, quote-unquote, Some people have, of course, argued that it is biological rather than sociological, that men are naturally more violent, for example, or that they're more stronger and therefore more capable of committing some crimes. She also blames something which she terms hypermasculinity, and then later on decries the lack of quote unquote male safe spaces where males can talk, share their feelings and emotions with others. And since the author, I mean, she, you know, she's a female, so I don't begrudge her offering up such a solution as a safe space event, since this actually may work for women. The fundamental flaw in her argumentation, as far as I can see, is that she fails to tackle the real questions, which are, at least in my opinion, why are men more likely to be convicted when they commit the same crimes as women, and why are they given harsher sentences versus women after convictions for the same crime? So what I'm keen to do with this video is twofold. Firstly, to explore the actual reasons for not only the vast explosion in the rates of incarceration, but why the majority of those serving time are male, and secondly, to explore the question of whether men are actually more likely to commit crimes than women, and perhaps offer a more sensible explanation for this difference that we see. In terms of the first focus of this video, one of our very simple thought experiments is to look at the rates of incarceration for the same offenses. If the reason men find themselves in prison more were biological, then we would have women facing similar sentences for the same offenses. And what I mean by this is actually pretty simple. So if something other than a gender bias were driving the male incarceration rates, then we would see almost zero divergence in sentencing patterns. So if a man and a woman commit the same offense, such as let's say aggravated assault, then they would both receive equal punishment. If they don't, then biology on its own can't fully explain why more men are in jail. There has to be some sort of a bias within the legal system, even if this bias is driven by biology, as it most certainly is. It's unlikely that men have some kind of a gene which makes us more likely to commit crimes. So, there's been a monumental increase in the prison population in most of the Western world. This increase has been largely made up of men and continues to be. According to the government in the UK, where I live, between June 1993 and June 2012, the prison population in England and Wales increased by 41,800 uh, you know, persons. The sentenced population increased after 1993 because the court sentenced more offenders to prison each year. The sentenced population increased after 1993 because the court sentenced more offenders to prison each year between 93 and 2002, and because offenders have been staying in prison longer. And all of the references I'm using are going to be in the description bar as usual. So between 1993 and 2008, the growth rate increased 
from an average of 2.5% per year to 4% per year. And since the, uh, 2009, the growth rate has actually s slowed very slightly to 1% a year. In the United States, the numbers are even more shocking. According to the Sentencing Project, the United States is the world's leader in incarceration with 2.2 million people currently in the nation's prisons and jails. And that's a 500% increase over the last 40 years. Changes in sentencing law and policy, not changes in crime rates, explain most of this increase. Many studies find that females benefit from their gender in sentencing decisions, such as the work of Nagel and Witzman in 1971 and Pope in 1975. And these researchers found that women appear to receive preferential treatment in sentencing over males. Efforts to explain this disparity have centered around two theories the kind of chivalry and more recently focal concern. So those are the two theories that attempt to at least explain this disparity. The vast majority of research shows that adult female offenders tend to receive milder sentences than male offenders. Furthermore, when compared to other extra legal factors such as offender age or race or ethnicity, the influence of gender is the most powerful. And this has been confirmed by study after study, for example, Ulmer and Kramer in 1998. So research findings typically show that females are between 12% and 23%, that's almost a quarter, less likely than males to receive prison or jail time. And that was based on a study by Farnworth and Tesk in 1995. Yet for these men and women who do receive prison sentences, gender effects are still there. Females receive shorter or less severe sentences, according to the findings of Bushway and Pyle in 2001. So when scripting this video, I often found about seven or eight articles at a minimum which supported all of the statements I'm going to make. I've included the most highly cited to essentially prevent this video from becoming a little bit too academic and dry, but the evidence is overwhelming and incontroversible. So in addition to a large body of empirical findings, the theoretical research seeking to explain how and why women offenders tend to receive milder sentences is also actually quite extensive. Two main theoretical stands really kind of pop out from the research. The chivalry thesis that I mentioned just earlier dates to the 1970 and is premised on cultural stereotypes about gender while more recent focal concerns theory looks specifically at the dynamics of judicial decision making. So just to give you a bit of background, the chivalry thesis posits that gender stereotypes about both men and women influence sentencing outcomes according to the sex of the offenders. It's sometimes known as a paternalism. So the kind of chivalry thesis asserts that women are stereotyped as fickle and childlike and therefore not fully responsible for their criminal behavior. Women therefore need to be protected by males who, with all due gallantry, are portrayed as wanting to minimize any pain or suffering women might experience. So according to the chivalry thesis, when these stereotypes are played out in the arena of the criminal justice system, they will result in preferential treatment for female offenders from predominantly male police officers, prosecutors, and judges. Thus, Prevailing stereotypes about men and women are predicted by the chivalry thesis to underlie outcomes showing milder criminal sentences for women. And the second theory I mentioned earlier is the focal concerns theory. And according to this view, constraints on the amount of time judges can spend on their cases and other factors mean that judges generally receive incomplete information on defendants and their cases. Confronted with these restrictions, judicial decisions on sentencing outcomes are thereby infused to some extent with the generalizations and personal bias. Judges and other court players commonly make contextual arbitrations about the defendant's culpability, character, and potential recidivism based on three focal concerns. The first is blameworthiness, the second is dangerousness, so it's a community protection uh, kind of issue there. And thirdly, practical constraints. They may, for example, attribute certain qualities to offenders based on their gender. Female offenders may be viewed as less of a risk to the community or to reoffend, while male offenders may be seen as more culpable and hence more responsible for their crimes. Males may also be portrayed as better able to do time in prison, uh, you know, or jail than female offenders. So combined with these focal concerns, 
it presents an apparatus that judges may come to rely on to manage the ambiguity because of their content, such focal concerns may lead to females being less likely to receive incarceration, and if they do, shorter sentences than men. There's also a, a well-known legal framework that I mentioned briefly in an earlier video where I responded to Julia Teriansky, and that legal framework is known as evidence-based sentencing. My source for this is an article penned by a professor, Sonia B. Starr, and she's an academic that I've tried to get onto my channel repeatedly to discuss this legal framework and its impact on gender sentencing disparities. Uh, and I don't want to speculate why she doesn't want to come onto my channel. Maybe she's too busy or she just has no interest. And, and that's fair enough, you know. So one of the things to note just before we delve into her article is that evidence-based sentencing is not practiced uniformly across the Western world. It, it is primarily a US creation. And of course, it has been enthusiastically adopted by the United Kingdom and Australia and quite a lot of other countries. And that's at least one of the reasons and possibly even a major causative factor in explaining why the US is leading the world in incarceration. So evidence-based sentencing refers to the use of a mathematical risk prediction instrument or a kind of series of these instruments. It's usually just a piece of software to guide the judge's sentencing decisions. The instruments are based on past regression analysis and the relationships between various offender characteristics and recidivism rates. So criminologists have developed a wide range of such instruments. Most of these instruments include gender, absolutely, gender. They put gender in there, age, employment status, and many also include education, and some include composite socioeconomic variables like financial status. So if you're, if you're a man and you're poorly educated or you're poor, you're fucked. Although risk prediction instruments used by some parole boards included race as late as the 1970s, the modern evidence-based sentencing instruments overwhelmingly do not. One exception is a sentencing support software promoted by, he's a now retired um, Oregon State Judge, Michael Marcus, but this has not been formally adopted by any state. So th these instruments are, are actually pretty mechanical. So every possible value of each variable corresponds to a particular increase or reduction in the risk estimates in every single case. The variable weights are not determined based on the case's circumstances. For example, men will always receive higher risk scores than otherwise identical women because averaged across all cases, men have higher recidivism rates. And I'm going to be going into that into why that is in just a little bit. So please do bear with me here. In practice, these instruments use a very, very simple kind of point system in which the high risk answer to a yes or no question results in a point or two being added to the defendant's score based only quite loosely on the underlying regression. And I'm going to explain what that means in just a little bit. So just to kind of continue here before I get into Sonia's article, Demographic variables and socioeconomic variables receive very, very substantial weights. For example, a score for each defendant on a scale of minus 8 to 7, where 4 to 7 is rated as good, 2 to 3 is above average, 0 to 1 is average, minus 1 to minus 2 is below average, minus 3 to minus 8 is poor. Most instruments in, in use include gender. And, and I'm hoping you're beginning to see why we're locked up at absolutely terrifying rates, because the software used to make decisions about the amount of jail time includes gender, and if you happen to be a guy, or if you happen to, let's say, not have a master's degree, or even, let's say, you know, a bachelor's degree, if you happen to not be particularly wealthy, if you happen to be living in a poor neighborhood, you will get more time simply because of that. So, for example, an unemployed high school dropout will score three points worse than an employed high school graduate, potentially making the difference between good and average or between average and poor. Likewise, a defendant under the age of 22 will score three points worse than a defendant over the age of 45. So if you're a young male, you are in all sorts of trouble when you get into the criminal justice system. And Douglas Berman, a professor at the University of Wisconsin, uh, law school states that in some form, nearly every state in the USA has adopted, or at least has been seriously considering, 
how to incorporate evidence-based research and alternatives to imprisonment in their sentencing policies and practices. So evidence-based sentencing has many enthusiastic you know, advocates in academia, the judiciary, the sentencing commissions, you know, think tanks and advocacy organizations. So, so they're rooting for men to go to jail for, for longer. So evidence-based sentencing depends on statistical generalizations about men and women based on statistical averages. So as a man, when you stand in front of a judge, you're at a disadvantage when it comes to sentencing irrespective of the actual issue at hand, you will automatically receive a harsher sentence due to evidence-based sentencing. So thanks for kind of bearing with me and sitting through the background. And what I'm going to do now is just get into Sonia Starr's paper because it's really, really an excellent paper. And I would encourage you to, to check the paper out. Uh, the, the link is in the description bar. And the paper's title is evidence-based sentencing and the scientific rationalization of discrimination. So she starts off with an abstract that states, this paper critiques on legal and empirical grounds the growing trend of basing criminal decisions on actorial recidivism risk prediction instruments that include demographic and socioeconomic variables. I, and she's of course referring to herself, this isn't myself speaking, I argue that this practice violates the Equal Protection Clause and is bad policy. An explicit embrace of otherwise condemned discrimination sanitized by scientific language to demonstrate that this practice should be subject to heightened constitutional scrutiny, I comprehensively review the relevant case law, much of which has been ignored by existing literature, to demonstrate that it cannot survive scrutiny and is undesirable policy. I review the empirical evidence underlying the instruments. I show that they provide wildly imprecise individual risk predictions, that there is no compelling evidence that they outperform judges in formal predictions, that less discriminatory alternatives would likely perform as well, and that the instruments do not even address the right question, the effect of a given sentencing decision on recidivism risk. Finally, I also present new suggestive empirical research based on a randomized experiment using fictional cases that these instruments should not be expected merely to substitute uh, you know actuarial predictions for less scientific risk assessments but instead to increase the weight given to recidivism risk versus other sentencing considerations so sonia continues within her paper by noting that criminal justice reformers have long worked towards a system in which defendants treatment does not depend on their socioeconomic status or demographics, but on their criminal conduct. I would certainly say that this is something all men want. That is the same sentencing for the same crime as women. But, you know, Sonia then goes on to say that, for example, judges should not systematically sentence defendants more harshly because they are poor or uneducated. And I would just personally add, and they also shouldn't be sentenced more lightly because they are women. And then she continues and, and, and basically uh, says in her paper, they, meaning the judges, should not follow a policy of increasing the sentences of male defendants or reducing those of females on the explicit basis of genders. They likewise should not increase a defendant's sentence specifically be because he or she grew up without a stable intact family or because he or she lives in a disadvantaged and crime-ridden community. And she basically goes on to say, look, it may surprise many readers then to learn that a growing number of U.S. jurisdictions are adopting policies that deliberately encourage judges to do all of these don'ts. These jurisdictions are directing sentencing judges to explicitly consider socioeconomic variables, gender, age, and sometimes family or neighborhood characteristics, not just in special contexts in which one of these variables might be particularly relevant, for instance, the ability to pay in cases involving fines, but routinely in all cases. And then she goes on to say, this is not a fringe development. It has now been embraced by the American Law Institute in the draft of the newly revised Model Penal Code, a development that reflects its mainstream acceptance due to the code's influence among the judiciary and criminal justice community. And I'm just going to add here, and there's a similar trend in Canada and the United Kingdom and other foreign jurisdictions. Meanwhile, the majority of states in the USA now similarly 
direct you know, parole boards to take demographic and socioeconomic factors into account. Unfortunately, I, I just couldn't find the exact percentage of states using this, but according to Sonia's article, she classifies that these states are absolutely in the majority, in the USA at least. So in 2013, at the time of writing this paper, she said, yeah, absolutely, it's, it's a majority of states. So from this point forward, I'm going to be reading very, very substantially from her paper. She presents her arguments extremely well, far better than I could. So she starts off by saying, look, evidence-based sentencing has been widely hailed by judges, advocates, and scholars as representing hope for a new age of scientifically guided sentencing. And the whole idea is to replace judges' clinical ev evaluations of defendants, that is a reliance on their own expertise, with actorial risk prediction, which is purportedly more accurate. Incongruously, this trend is now being pushed by progressive reform advocates who hope that it will reduce incarceration rates by enabling courts to identify low-risk offenders. In this article, I argue that they're making a mistake. As currently practiced, evidence-based sentencing should neither be seen as progressive nor especially scientific, and it is almost certainly unconstitutional. The technocratic framing of evidence-based sentencing should not obscure an inescapable truth. Sentencing based on instruments amounts to overt discrimination based on demographics and socioeconomic status. The instruments typically do not include race as a variable. Even their most enthusiastic defenders have limits on their comfort with group-based punishment. But sentencing based on socioeconomic predictors will have a racially disparate impact as well. Of course they will. Equal treatment of all persons is a central normative objective of the criminal justice system. And evidence-based sentencing may have serious social consequences contributing to the concentration of the criminal justice system's punitive impact on those who are already disproportionately bearing its brunt. And moreover, the express message of evidence-based sentencing to the justification of disparate treatment based on statistical generalizations about crime risk is, when stripped of the, you know, anodyne scientific language toxic, group-based generalizations about dangerousness are not, not innocuous. They have an insidious history in our culture and the express embrace of additional punishment for the poor, and I'm just going to add, and male, conveys a message that the system is rigged. Well, of course it is, uh, Sonia. So the instrument's use of gender and socioeconomic variables should be subject to heightened constitutional scrutiny. So again, what Sonia confirms is this, that if you're a less than wealthy man from a disadvantaged background, or even if you're you know, just from a wealthy background, as a man, you already start off at an insurmountable disadvantage in the criminal justice system. Being male will give you a higher risk score and you're, you're more likely to go to jail, you're more likely to serve a longer sentence, and you're less likely to be granted parole. You will be dealt with far more harshly simply because you're a male. And of course, based on other factors, whether they be demographic or socioeconomic, for example, if you live in a poor neighborhood, or if you, for example, didn't finish college, things get much worse for you. And now we arrive at the second part of this video. And what I really, really actually wanted to spend this part of the video doing was to determine if women are indeed just as prone to commit crimes as men, but simply less likely to face arrest. However, just before I go into that, I, I think there's something incredibly important to note, which everybody absolutely tends to forget. And that is that within the societies that we've had, whether they be Western societies, whether they be, you know, societies in the, in the East or Africa, women simply have far less reason to resort to crime at any point in their lives. In the West, we have a myriad of social welfare schemes available to them exclusively from free housing to income support, simply because they happen to be women. In, for example, Africa or Nigeria, where I happen to come from, a woman won't have to resort to crime. She can simply marry, and her husband will be expected legally to provide for her. What most people think of a kind of criminal, 
you know, particularly a convicted criminal who resorts to fraud or theft or, you know, most people tend to think of the kind of Hollywood or sitcom image. And this isn't actually the reality. Most criminals aren't in gangs uh, and the overwhelming majority of individuals who resort to theft or, or fraud or, you know, some sort, they're not recidivists. And study after study has presented some very, very consistent reasons why people actually do resorts of crime. Mm -hmm. And you might actually be surprised about what motivates people to steal. And it's not necessarily about being poor or not having enough money. According to the research, the dynamic that influences people to shift their moral standards is a feeling of being financially deprived. And that feeling can be elucidated in many different ways, for, for, obviously for different people. And, and there's a really, really important study and I've uh, put the, again, put the link in the uh, description bar that suggests that this feeling is far more prevalent than we think. Uh, and the study's title is Financial Deprivation Selectively Shifts Moral Standards and Compromises Moral Decisions. And it's by a researcher known as Isha Sharma and her colleagues. It was a pretty well-run study, actually. So they, they looked across five different experiments. So it's almost like a meta-analysis. So the research team that found that feeling financially deprived is the trigger for a range of morally questionable behaviors, from simple theft to white-collar crimes like embezzlement to destructive crimes like office sabotage. These results hold true despite the fact that people in general believe that they're unlikely to behave dishonestly regardless of their financial situation. People who feel deprived, even briefly, are far more likely to cheat for small sums of money, and this often accounts for everyday crimes like workplace pilfering, whether it's money from the cash drawer or pocketing office supplies. So when we combine this with data from an article titled, you know, Seven Facts About Government Benefits and Who Gets Them, where the authors conclude that federal assistance is far more likely to go to women than men, and they suggest 61% gains to women versus 49% for men. And according to, you know, State Senator Glenn Grothman, a single parent, and of course he meant a single mother, with a couple of kids can easily get $35,000 a year in total benefits from health care and earned income credit and a food share and a low-income housing and, you know, whatever. That's after taxes. So my question to you is this. What need would a woman have to actually turn to crime? I mean, the fact that some of them do turn to crime should actually be shocking. Not only can they turn to a protector, provider, husband, but there's also the state. Men simply don't have these you know, opportunities. So, of course, when will a woman ever feel financially deprived enough to turn to theft, extortion, or you know, forging checks if she can collect a cool 35 grand a year each and every year till the rest of her life from the government. In the UK, where I live, after the introduction of the 1977 Housing Act, also known as the Homeless Persons Act, women gained a priority status to government housing through their connection with children or pregnancy. So what does this tell us? This tells us that part of the reason more men commit nonviolent crimes is simply due to the fact that when they have problems, there are very, very few social services to actually help them, you know, so when they're facing pretty dire economic circumstances, so for example, if you're undereducated, unable to hold down a regular job, or if you fall on hard times, when faced with the possibility of starvation or homelessness, men will sure be forced to turn to crime more frequently and for longer than females, who are shielded by the state from most of life's unfortunate events. You know, should she be unable to hold down a job, she will be provided free or subsidized housing. Should she fall on hard times, she'll be handed a free welfare check. If she's in a high-risk category, should she fall pregnant? Well, for sure, she can just crack open the champagne. She's going to be supported for the rest of her life by the taxpayer. Another thing that we have to contend with when addressing gender and crimes is the pervasive idea that men are simply more naturally violent, that we as a gender are more prone to violence outbursts, and this plays a role in the higher male incarceration rates. And I'm just going to come out and say this. That's junk science of the highest order. And, and it's based on the kind of pervasive but nonsensical idea that testosterone promotes aggression automatically. This notion is counter to the scientific evidence. And, and it's really an invention of, uh, I guess, tabloid newspaper science reporters. A really excellent article that was picked up and, uh, and I guess, serialized 
in Scientific American sums this up rather well. So a psychologist, James uh, Dabbs, of Georgia State University in Atlanta made a career out of conducting studies connecting testosterone to every kind of lifestyle imaginable. And in his book, Heroes, Rogues and Lovers, he noted that athletes, actors, blue collar workers and con men tended to have higher levels of testosterone than clerks, intellectuals and administrators. So what would be important to address is whether this correlation was the cause or the effect of the environment that, that these men found themselves in, which is to say, are higher testosterone males more likely to become violent criminal, or does being a violent criminal raise a man's testosterone levels? And no one really knows the answer, but a growing body of evidence suggests that testosterone is as much the result of violence as it is the cause. Indeed, both Winning a sports match and beating an opponent at chess can boost testosterone levels. On the other hand, losing a sporting match, growing old, or becoming obese all reduce levels of testosterone. So Peter Gray at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, actually said, that's just a great, great article again. He said, look, the causal arrow goes both ways. And he said, look, there's evidence in humans that just as in animals, testosterone is responsive to male, you know, male-on-male -male competition. And he went on to say, look, from what we can tell, testosterone is generated to prepare the body to respond to competition and or challenges to one's status. Any stimulus or event which signals either of these things can trigger an increase in testosterone levels. And the authors basically concluded that there's a very, very weak correlation between testosterone and violence. So I'm just going to say that again. There's a weak correlation between testosterone and violence. Furthermore, these individuals who see testosterone as a primary cause of violence, completely ignore the myriad of evidence that points to women being just as violent, perhaps even more so in intimate relationships. For example, The Independent published an article titled, Women Are More Violent. And that study says, and I'm just going to read from it directly, the study which challenges the long-standing view that women are overwhelmingly the, the victims of aggression is based on an analysis of 34,000 men and women by a British academic. And in the article, I mean, they basically concluded that women lash out more frequently than their husbands or boyfriends. And the author, John Archer, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK, and is also the president of the International Society for Research on Aggression. So this individual knows what he's you know, talking about. So he went on to say, look, male violence represents a serious phenomenon. He says, men proved more likely than women to injure their partners. Female aggression tends to involve pushing, slapping, and hurling objects. Yet men made up nearly 40% of the victims in the cases that he studied, a figure much higher than previously reported. And Professor Archer analyzed the data from 82 US and UK studies on relationship violence dating back to 1972. He also looked at 17 studies based on victims' reports from 1,140 men and women. And he said that female aggression was greater in westernized women because they were, quote unquote, more economically emancipated and therefore not afraid of end ending a relationship. Uh, and hopefully this statement at the end of the article by Professor Archer puts an end to the notion by the tradcons that women are just more gentle naturally under traditionalism women were forced to toe the line. So they essentially kept their mouths shut and played nice. Now they make their own money, they've shown themselves to be just as violent as men. And another article published in The Telegraph adds far more weight to the kind of evidence of women being just as prone to commit acts of violence as, as men. And, and the article's title is Women Are More Controlling and Aggressive Than Men in Relationships. And again, I'm just going to read from this article. And uh, the author basically went on to say, look, women are more likely to be aggressive and controlling towards their partner. And the research found that women showed controlling behavior along with serious levels of threats, intimidation, and physical violence when in relationships more often than men. More than 1,000 young men and women were questioned about any intimate partner violence they had inflicted on a boyfriend or girlfriend or had been subjected to themselves. So this is actually a well put together study because they're asking women and men, look, have you ever hit or intimidated or thrown something at your partner? 
And women are absolutely coming out to say, yeah, you know, we, we've done that. Because I guess there's no punishment whatsoever if they do that. So the results are in contrast to earlier studies which suggested women are always the victims of such behaviour. Dr. Elizabeth Bates, who led the study, and she's from the University of Cambria, said previous studies have sought to explain male violence towards women as arising from patriarchal values, which motivates men to seek to control women's behaviour using violence if necessary. This study found that women de demonstrated a desire to control their partners and were more likely to use physical aggression than men. It wasn't just pushing and shoving, said Dr. Bates, who presented the results at the meeting of the British Psychology Society in Glasgow. Some people were circling the boxes for things like beating up, kicking, and threatening to use a weapon. In terms of high levels of control and aggression, there is no difference between men and women. And one final thing, in this video you might have noticed that I've yet to challenge a large and I believe erroneous assumption. And that is the assumption that the percentage of people prosecuted or brought to trial is pretty much equal for both genders. The thing is that assumption is not based on any form of fact. A research study on behalf of the United Nations by researchers Harvey and Pease titled Gender Differences in Criminal Justice concluded that Analysis of the second and third United Nations crime surveys reveals that males are disproportionately suspected, apprehended, prosecuted, and imprisoned throughout the, you know, the world. And, and again, just to be clear here, this is uniform across the world. It's more likely that a man will be arrested, he'll be suspected, and the DA or the national you know, kind of equivalent are more willing to take a man to court in the first place. So this means that if we go all the way back to that article where the researchers point out that men and women commit intimate partner violence at pretty much equal rates, we're, we're going to see several effects. The first thing is this. Some men are arrested and brought to trial for crimes of women. Crimes these men have actually not committed in the first place, for example, where the man is clearly acting in self-defense and the police officers simply arrest him in blind obedience to their gynocentric urges. Secondly, of the cases where they correctly identify a female perpetrator, we will see a higher percentage of these never actually being brought to trial. So women are far more likely to have charges against them dropped. And this is according to the United Nations. And this also considers the fact that, of course, men are far more likely to be victims of false accusations of intimate partner violence, um, you know, or sexual assault or rape, especially in places with these uh, no-drop prosecutions uh, for these offences, where once the charge has been made, it f just has to go to court, you know, even if she lied or whatever. So, are women and loving and gen gentle? No, of course, you know, you know, Sandra Anderson, who shot her husband while he was sleeping. How loving and gentle is that? Or the guy who was hit by a tire iron by his loving wife. So, you know, thank you very, very much, guys. This is a CS Mixer.